Hello, everybody. This is Tiffany with the Speak Up and Inspire series. And today I am going to be talking to Miss Tina Torres. Um, she is a survivor. She's an advocate. She's a business owner. She's a model. She is everything that she can possibly be right now. She is living her best life. So tonight we're going to be talking to her about what she has going on right now and advocating for issues that are dear to her and personal for her. And then also being a survivor. We are about to go into Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So this is a great way for us to start off October 2020. So hello, Miss Tina. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I am doing great. I'm doing great. Thank you so much for asking. It is nice to finally get you on the Speak Up and Inspire series. This has been in the making for a while. Yep, I'm, I'm excited to be here. I know our schedules be so crazy. I know. And this week, so I was like, yep, I'm gonna do it. And then I'm like, wait, I'm still a swamp. But you know what, you are so beautiful. And I got to meet your baby. So I was like, yep, I'll make time for her. <laughs> yes, thank you. Well, thank you for making time for me. I really appreciate that. Um, we're going to just jump right in because we we're a couple of minutes late and that's on me. So I want to just go ahead and jump right in. Um, Miss Tina, we're going into um, Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And I know that you have your own company. She did that. Do you have anything up in October? Yes, we actually do. We have the Purple Gala. This is year five. It's taking place this Saturday at the at Doco Manor uh, in Blythewood, South Carolina, actually, this time. Um, this event centers around domestic violence awareness. Uh, we actually have speakers that come and tell their story. And we also have poetry. This year we'll have a plated meal, um, an open bar, as well as a couple other things, some more surprises that will be taking place at the gala that will be announced this year. Very so, yeah. nice, very nice. So do you have your um, your list of speakers? Can you share who's gonna be speaking? Yes, Kwan Finch uh, with Journey Towards Purpose. She will be doing some information in regards to, um, oh, what's she doing? I got it, I got it. <laughs> oh, statistics and things like that, how to identify if you are in a domestic violence situation. We okay. will also have officers from the sheriff's department that'll come and speak about their, you know, your rights, you know, what happens from the moment you, you call in, where do you, what do you do, where do you go from there, different things like that. And then our keynote speaker is Sunshine, well, Trisha Pollard, but she goes by Sunshine P okay. and she is our keynote speaker. And then we'll have some poetry as well. And then, um, like I said, a couple of other surprises. Very nice, very nice. Um, you said you've been having this now. You said this is the fifth fifth year? Fifth year. Very nice, good. So tell me, what made you start doing these galas? Was it just for a platform for survivors or what, what made you start the, this? Uh, well, we started, actually we started with fashion shows first. We had, I think we had three years of doing the fashion show. And from there we decided to do a gala. It's not very often that you actually can get really dressed up and look your best and also at the same time bring awareness to something that people keep sweeping underneath the rug. Right. Um, Domestic violence is swept under, underneath the rug, you know, for a very, very long time. And so therefore we decided that why not get dressed up as well as support a, a cause at the same time. So this very is why nice. we do it. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Um, well, you and I met because we were, um, I was looking for different advocates and different survivors in different parts of the Southern states. And I was introduced to you by Mr. Del Vaughn um, because he told me, he said, I know a survivor and she's awesome. And so he <laughs> referred me to you. And so you and I have been in touch mainly on Facebook, but been following you for a, for a while and had the chance and the pleasure to meet you very briefly briefly during the summer. So um, tell me a little bit about your story, if you don't mind sharing. I don't mind sharing. Um, ever since the time that I can remember, and I think I can remember back to the age of five or six, I have witnessed domestic violence ever since then. So I grew up in the middle of it. I would, I would, be, I would be sent to my aunt's house. It'd be the same thing over there, sent to another aunt's house, same thing over there. Mm -hmm. So I grew up 
you know, in the midst of it all. And so the assumption during that time as I got older, younger, teen, as well as an adult, that domestic violence was supposed to be my life. Right. It almost it seemed I as would, though it almost seemed as though um, it was I'm supposed to be in a relationship where I'm supposed to get beat on every day or yelled at, things thrown at me, things like that. So the assumption was that that's the type of relationship that I'm supposed to be in. And that's the type of relationships I, I look for um, mm -hmm. and accepted them. So my story basically is um, witnessing that me, being molested, child abuse, you know, becoming teen pregnancy, high school dropout, suicide, depression, um, you know, three kids by the time I was 20, homeless, living in a shelter, standing in line for food, getting, you know, being on welfare for a certain amount of time, living in public housing. You know, I just had to, that was my life, you know, majority of it until probably like in my early thirties or so. Wow. But you've been through a lot. Yes. <laughs> wow. Um, so how does your family feel now that you're now an advocate against domestic violence, being that you grew up in a family that knew domestic violence sounds like, you know, pretty much across the board? My aunt's um, my mom is still married to my dad who molested me and my stepdad. So that relationship there has become null and void uh, as of about two months ago. Um, I don't know what I can do differently to get my mom to just see that I'm, I'm human, that I'm here, um, and that I just really wanted her to just hug me and tell me that she loved me. But um, I think that that's hard for her. So, um, and then she still wants everything to be the same with her husband, you know, celebrate his birthday, blah, blah, blah. And that's, I can't, it's hard. I just, it's just not there. So I've been struggling with that for the last couple of months, not, not being able to talk to my mom. So that sucks because I'm a mom. Yeah. So that bothers me a great deal. I'm sure it does. Um, I know that my uh, relationship with my mom um, was pretty difficult my teenage years and into my early 20s because mm -hmm. of abuse that took place in, in um, my home and you know what I dealt with in growing up. And mm -hmm. I felt like my mom should have protected me and she should have advocated for me more. Right. Um, but then one day I just, I had enough and I, um, I had enough and I basically faced mm -hmm. the person who hurt me and told them, you know, I'm not gonna allow you to hurt me anymore, even though it had stopped at that point, but mentally and emotionally, it was still bothering me. And I right. still didn't have a good relationship with my mom because I felt like she didn't protect me or, and she wasn't really advocating on my behalf. And then come to find out that she really didn't know the, the seriousness and the depth of what happened. Mm -hmm. um, because he, he wasn't honest in right. telling her. And, you know, even when we went to court, my mom didn't come, but that's because of what she was told. And so she really didn't know the full story until that day. And I think I was about 21, 22 when everything came out because I just let it go. <laughs> so that kind of started the process of me building a relationship with my mom and um, was me facing the person that hurt me and then letting her. I basically brought her into it to say, I'm not going to allow this and you didn't protect me. And so, right. um, yeah, I definitely understand that. It's, it's hard not having a relationship with your mom and she, you know, she's still alive. And so I definitely understand that. Um, what do you do because you've been um, a survivor of abuse, child abuse, um, molestation, so forth and so on. What did you do as a mother to protect your kids? And what are some of the things that you would tell other moms to protect their kids? Uh, so my daughters couldn't spend the night out. Um, even if the couple was married, 
um, or if it was a single parent and there was a, a, a boy there, um, it didn't matter the age. Um, and even, even when I thought about, even when I thought that that might be safe, I was raped by a woman. And so, and my girls were very small at the time. So therefore I kept them with me. They couldn't spend the night out. They couldn't, you could come to my house. You could tell your friends to come, they can come here. But I kept my girls underneath me 24, not 24 seven. We all know that's not reality, but um, you know, if they weren't at school, then they were home. Their friends could come and stay at the house with me. Um, my house became the community house. You could, mm -hmm. everybody's, everybody's mom could find their kids at my house. I talked to my kids straightforward. I didn't hold any punches about their private parts. We talked about the different type of names that men and or women could come up with that would make them comfortable to take their clothes off or think that the touch was okay. We talked about those things. I didn't like, I talked to them, you know, like straight up, you know, letting them know what was going on. So um, I think having that dialogue with your kids is important and letting them know that um, good touch, bad touch, you know, the okay touch, different things like that is important. So having an open dialogue with your kids and then letting your children know they can come and talk to you about anything. It doesn't matter what it is. No secret is a secret. No matter what anybody tells you, come talk to mom, come talk to dad, come talk to somebody that you trust. Um, so I tell, I, that's how I was with my girls. And to this day, they are so protective. We have a four-year-old granddaughter, their four-year-old niece. And whenever she visits her other family, when she comes back, we check in her body. That's just how we are. You know what I'm saying? So um, I would just say open dial dialogue, know where your kids are going, know who's going to be in the house. You know, it's okay to pop up if they're somewhere that you've left them for a couple of hours pop in, you know, go down the street, come right back, just to double check. I'd, mm -hmm. I'd rather be overprotective than underprotective. Yeah, I definitely understand that. We did a, um, a uh, like a panel a few months ago and the, we were sharing some things that you should teach your children. And one of those mm -hmm. was, you know, talking about the body parts, naming the body parts for what they are, not giving them nicknames and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, leaving the lines of communication open, knowing um, when you're being groomed for, for abuse and so forth and so on. Um, and then, yeah, really being careful about where your kids go because they say that the majority of kids who are molested or abused is by somebody that they know. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, being very careful about where they go. Um, I'm the same way. I prefer for my kids' friends to come to me because that way I know what's going on. Um, I trust very few people with them going and staying overnight somewhere else. So I definitely get all of yes. that that you just said. <laughs> and unfortunately, because we're both survivors, we know the, the threat, but that makes us better equipped to be able to protect our children, definitely. Right. I can say uh, my granddaughter came home one day and we were, I was putting her in the tub and she said, oh, I gotta hide my cookie. And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> So she was, she, she pointed to her private part and I was like, who told you that's a cookie? She was like, our teacher, our daycare teacher said it's, you know, we have to protect our cookie. And I was like, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. when I explained to the daycare teacher, when you tell them that a person can honestly manipulate them enough to get them to let them see their cookie. That's very true. Don't teach them that. Or I, what? I say don't teach them that, but that four-year-old, don't teach her that. Right. Because, and I told Natalia, take that out your vocabulary. That's not what that's called. Right. And I don't want you letting anybody talk to you about no type of cookies other than the ones we bake in the oven. Right. Right. Yeah. And that's and that's a, that's a real that's a real scenario. Um, mm -hmm. I've worked in daycare before, and I had a child who was being abused, and she called her her personal part everything but what it was called. And oh so God. one one thing that I learned from that experience is that 
police officers, social workers, counselors, they can manipulate that too mm -hmm. to take away the validity of the of the assault when a child is not able to name their body parts. So yeah. it's really yeah. important that they understand what yeah. those body parts are and what they're called. Exactly. exactly. Yes, so at what point did you go from being a victim to a survivor? And I say that because um, when I go out and I talk to people and share my experience, I always tell them there's a mindset behind being a victim and a survivor. And that's wanting to survive and knowing that you're a victim and doing the, the steps that's needed to, to heal that's when you can start talking about being a survivor and being an advocate and so forth when you're making taking the steps necessary for you to heal and being able to admit to yourself and forgive yourself um so at what point do you feel that you became a survivor and not just a victim um i think i still have some of the victim within because mm -hmm. um i'm able to still see those triggers right mm -hmm. So, and then what just happened with my mom, you know, that I still have some of that. And I'm, I, so I, I can honestly say for me, mm -hmm. I'm still, I still have a little bit of that with me. I think we all do. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. So um, as far as getting to a point where I needed to start protecting myself, I think, I think that was like probably in my late twenties, thirties, somewhere around there that I got to realize that this, and I hid it very well from my kids, but um, I got to a point where I was like, this cannot possibly be what this is supposed to be about. And right. I would see other people just as happy. And I would be like, one person I questioned, I was like, do you, do you, do you eventually get past the abuse to love? And she was like, what abuse? <clears throat> so eventually she was able to tell me that that's not love. That's just a person trying to be in control and be man manipulative based on what they've gone through in their lives prior to meeting me. Right. So eventually I got it together. You know, um, the first, well, the first time I got it together, I was a little younger and I went and lived in a shelter with my three daughters. And then from there, I started to build myself up, but I was, my mind was so messed up. I was yearning for that being yelled at for being hit on, being pushed around. I looked for it because it, it was an addiction almost. It was like, I know that, that has to be it. Why am I fighting for it? Why am I looking for it? Um, so it was a process. Some people think that you could just up and leave. And for some, it, it may be, but for some of us, me, um, it's a process and it's trying to understand how do I, what levels do I need to be on before I can honestly say I'm physically and mentally okay? Right. Um, so it took a while, not gonna lie. It took like maybe the 10 step program or something. <laughs> I really don't know, yeah. <laughs> but it took going into a shelter, living in um, emergency housing and then living in the, um, I call it the projects because it is what it is, mm -hmm. um, low income housing and then Finally, I got my house built through Habitat for Humanity. So with all, with all of those different steps and still trying to find myself and still trying to figure out who I was, I eventually learned that this was not love. This was actually a control mechanism mm -hmm. and I needed to be free. I needed to compromise, compromise versus controlled. And so, yeah, so eventually I got it together and then I ended up talking just about it at first, but it wasn't to to push other people, it was for me so that I could talk, I could learn how to release some of it. And so it just kind of went from there. And then I just started being there for everybody and helping people move and, you know, creating things to, so that I could just help people in general. I knew what it was like to be homeless. I knew what it was like not to have food on the table, not to have a permanent roof over your head. I knew what all those things were like not having school for clothes for kids. I knew what all of that was like. So I began to get more involved with my community and learning all the different ways that I could pull in resources to help other people. And I help other people because I do remember what that was like. And it's, it's just always gonna stay with me. So right. it, it's, it's a process. 
Yeah, they say that some of the best mentors and counselors or so forth are the ones who've been through it. And mm -hmm. I firmly, firmly believe that. Um, mm -hmm. So I applaud you for taking that extra step to become an advocate because, you know, it's, it's a, it's a victory when you feel that I've survived this, like I can finally move on past the pain, even though that pain will come and seep in sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think, I, I, I know I can't say that I don't ever have triggers because I do. And I don't know any advocates I can say, I am completely healed. I've never had any triggers. You know, I never think about it, you know? So um, I think even, even though we're survivors and advocates doesn't mean that we don't have those moments where, um, you know, something, something happens, there's a trigger, someone has said something, you see something on TV or something like that. And it, 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 it brings back those, those old hurts. Um, so mm -hmm. you're not alone. You're not alone. We all know <laughs> that. <laughs> um, so tell me, um, what is your, I guess, I know that you, you know, you, you're still healing, just like I'm still healing. Um, what are your, your passions, um, right now in the community? Where are you most focused on right now? Um, I'm focused on, because of the pandemic, the rates for domestic violence, child abuse, child molestation, all of those rates have risen significantly. Okay. Uh, and so my goal is to, um, well, and we're going to drop some things at the gala, um, mm -hmm. but the goal that we're looking forward to doing is having extra or a ton of extra resources to be able to help both men and women that are in certain situations to get them out so that we have the funds, the, the, the tools, everything so that we're able to assist as many people as we can, you know, daily throughout the week. Um, and I know that's huge, um, but I've always been a little girl that dreamed so much through all of her hurt. And so, um, my goal is to really just help others and to really help with, you know, do they need assistance with resumes? Do they need assistance with learning certain things on Microsoft, you know, Word, Excel, you know, some of these companies require you to know that those things. Mm -hmm. Um, and so my goal is to equip and assist anyone that is actually trying to push further so that they have a stronger foundation at home. So their children will be able to, you know, move forward and happy as well. I believe that when the parents are good, the kids are good. Yeah, yes, I agree with that as well. Um, so where are you based at? I am in Columbia, South Carolina. Okay, um, so how does domestic violence um, look there in Columbia? We are the, um, well, South Carolina ranks number five for the, um, for the rates here. Uh, and we're going to discuss more of that this Saturday. Um, so we do, sister care is the big, is the main hub um, that, you know, and they receive lots and lots of federal dollars and that's great. You have some, and but they're crowded, they're full. Mm -hmm. So there's not enough houses here to house, you know, male and or females who need assistance with families, who need assistance from getting, getting away from domestic violence situations. Mm -hmm. That's um, the same here. <laughs> same there too. Right. Yeah. And so um, the goal is to have that assistance, you know, outside of them because people need it or mm -hmm. want it. Um, and so the other thing is males. There are not any support systems for males that are in domestic violence situations. You're very and that's so, very much. That's another thing that we're looking at, looking at creating, not trying to, we are going to create it one way or another. Right. And it, mm -hmm. it can be everywhere. We, it just, I just haven't found any right here in this city. Uh, so those are the two things that we are trying to, that we are looking at now. Um, and the rates have gone on up, even though it's considered a dead law, it's still a law that the husband can take his wife or the, the, the married couple can go on the state fair, uh, state steps, state house steps, and he could be her right there on the steps, and there's nothing that can be done. 
That's a South Carolina law. <laughs> yeah, it's a, we we call it a dead law, but it's 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 on the books. Wow! And what does this law say? Say again. Um. So if I'm married, mm-hmm. my husband, and we go to the state steps, state mm-hmm. um, house steps, my husband can beat on me right there. Yeah. Wow. So with that law, which should be dead, in place. <laughs> I'm assuming that South Carolina, that's probably the reason why they're on the number number five of yeah, the list for high domestic violence and child abuse and so forth. South Carolina is ridiculous. Wow. I've never it's, heard that law. It's, it's ridiculous and yeah. um, it doesn't make sense. And it actually, and that's why we are, we do our best with Kawan Finch Webster. She's amazing. Mm-hmm. And she does, she does amazing work with making sure the word is out there. Ashley Hill is quite a few of us, you know, here in Columbia that fight really hard mm-hmm. to um, uh, get the word out. Vanessa Guten, she's another one. I mean, we are, we don't call it ground zero. We just call it the ground. Right. We get out there and we, we fight, you know, we figure out what we need to do to help others. But yeah, South Carolina ranks number five. Wow. Um, that the, that just takes me back to the early 1900s and slavery. You know, um, mm-hmm. slavery was legal, and you could beat your slave, and you can do all kinds of atrocities to your slave. And that sounds the same way that a husband basically has a has his wife as a slave, and he can do whatever he wants. And that's and I just took a defense class, and that's another class we're going to be advocating for you know, women to take as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't like watch a video right. and let us know what you think. We physically got hit on. We mm-hmm. physically had to take a gun out of somebody's hand. We had to learn how to, t- you know, take a knife out of somebody's hand. So it's things mm-hmm. like that. And there's nothing right. wrong with being equipped to make sure that you protect yourself. Right. Wow. And there's another training coming up for that. But yeah, I was, I was, when there are certain things that we did that brought back some memories mm-hmm. so at first I was I was scared to even fight back but right. the, I needed to and right. that also helped me it also helped me become a stronger survivor gotcha gotcha um I know that that's something um we have a young man here that uh, we've worked with uh, Damon DeLeon and he um, teaches self-defense. And he's been, from the time I met him, I talked to him about the importance of women in general being able to um, Mm -hmm. be able to defend themselves, but even more how we need to have more survivors and more victims learn how to protect themselves. Because a lot of times our victims have children and so they still have to be in communication and they still have to see their abusers if they don't have certain legal things in place. And so sure, sure. You know, we need to we need to be able to be, defend ourselves and victims need to be able to defend themselves going right. forward. So um, yes, that, that's definitely something that's needed. Um, I would say for all women, even our girls need to learn how to defend themselves. And our, I mean, everyone period, but definitely our, our girls and, um, and our women need to be able to defend ourselves. Yes, definitely. So um, she did that. Is that your event business or is that also your adv- advocacy or tell me a little bit more about that? So she did that actually started out thinking that she could sell clothes online and it was going to be <laughs> fabulous. So it didn't end up doing that way because I was like, wait, this is a lot of work, right? <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, I tried that. It's a lot of work, yes. <laughs> so, um, but then... Um, my girls, you remember the show, uh, MTV Sweet 16? Yes. Uh-huh. Okay. So my kids just thought their mom was rich. I'm not <laughs> sure where they got that from. They didn't realize that I was making it work off of, I think at that time I might've been making 28,000 a year. Yeah. Mm-hmm. At the time that they were asking me. And, um, <laughs> so it was a matter of how was I going to pull off this Sweet 16 for my yeah. oldest? Yeah. And so, um, so they were, but anyway, I made it work some type yeah. of way. <laughs> we always do. We're moms, right? <laughs> they looked, they had a great time, right? Nice, right. great DJ and everything. But anyway, so I just started doing little events here and there. So then yeah. it grew into, I changed it and made it into, 
it, it was she did that but then I just changed it into she did that events because I started doing events then right. I started doing weddings and then I started doing fundraisers and then when I realized that when we started doing the fashion show and it ended up being you know ways for us to bring money in to help within the community those that needed the assistance mm -hmm. then we just started doing that more as well and now yeah. I still do weddings and stuff because we just I just did one yesterday mm -hmm. uh, so it ended up being that but then when I sat with great mentors like Indigo Dawn and Joy McLaughlin Harris mm -hmm. I realized that um I was doing more more of right. assisting others and 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 finding ways for others to smile right and so then we just started putting some of that in our mission of you know these are the type of things that we did advocacy community mm -hmm. you know then it was like tina you need to speak and i was like no, <laughs> so tina you need to write a book no i don't so it was right. like different things that I just was not comfortable with. Just put mm -hmm. me in the background. You guys stand out front. But <laughs> I realized that my voice mat was making a difference. And so I tried to come out a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And then I started doing video speaking and all that stuff with you guys. And so it's just like, okay, well, I guess I need to speak up some more. So yeah. yeah. So um, it was event. It was closed at first. Then it was events. And we still do events, but we do a lot of advocacy work as well. Very nice, very nice. Well, the, I, that one of the questions that you just you just threw out there, I'm gonna just at, go ahead and ask you again. Is there a book in the future that we can look forward to? <laughs> um, yeah, so I struggle with that because it's like, who wants to hear me or who wants to read read about me? Right. Um, so I'll, I'll start and then I'll be like, nobody wants to read that, and then I'll push it to the side. <laughs> And then yeah. sometimes I'll look at it and then I'll start and I'll write some more. So right. I'm working on something now, whether it, I don't know what it's going to do, but whether it's a voiceover for something or, or whatever, um, I know that I need to finish it, finish yes. whatever it is it's going to be. Yes. And you have an amazing story. Um, I thought the same way when I was writing Reality Check because it, it literally mm -hmm. is my story, but given to other characters. And I thought the same thing, who wants to read this? But then once I started reading and I kind of put it out there for people to, to read it, um, I got really positive feedback. So I'm gonna be the one that's gonna say, be your cheerleader and say, girl, you better write that story. <laughs> <laughs> There's a million people that wanna read your story because you have no idea how many people you can help by publishing your story. You just never know. And if you reach one person, you save one person, and you, and help one person, then it's all worth it. I promise. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> whatever that may be, <laughs> whether it's a book, a play, whatever that is, whatever. And that is. see, people were concerned about us having the gala this weekend because of COVID. But what I wanted people to understand is that every year we have the gala, people reach out and be like, "I need help. Right. I need your help. Can you please right. help me? You know what right. I'm saying? And I." And I could not not do it. I yeah. had to do it. And even if us, with us only being able to have 150 people in the building, mm -hmm. and we have the social distance, but we have masks for everybody and hand their own personal hand sanitizer. Mm -hmm. You know, we you know we pulled out the stops to make sure that they feel everybody feels comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, I still wanted to push forward with it because I still want somebody who may come across it mm -hmm. to know that we're we're still here yeah, you're we're, still, still, yeah. we're still here we're st we're still we still out there with sneakers and heels and mm -hmm. and ballerina slippers we are out <laughs> here. still yeah. here to help um we are going to go live with some pieces of the event mm -hmm. um because it may be somebody out there who may come across the live that's in need mm -hmm. and they're going to be able to inbox us immediately to be able to for us to be able to help them at that point very, so, nice. Mm -hmm. very nice i'm proud of you for continuing you. um for continuing to do that that's really important so I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna switch gears a little bit so miss tina i saw that you are going for miss columbia south carolina tell us about that girlfriend <laughs> currently i hold the title of miss plus columbia 2020 whoop, whoop. <laughs> I am <laughs> not sure how I got myself roped up into that. 
<laughs> I am running for Miss Plus South Carolina on November the 14th. Ooh, um, nice. Yeah. So, yeah, so in the midst of prepping for the gala and doing work within the community and all that, we're preparing for a gala, I mean, a um, pageant at the same time. Wow, so, that is exciting. <laughs> that is exciting. <laughs> well, I just want to throw my name in the bucket. When you're looking for speakers for next year's gala, please, please let me know. I would love to be okay. a part of your gala. Um, okay. If not, if, if nothing else, attend with our um with the bvp board we would love to come and support you okay. um and uh yeah so how can we find out more about um miss south carolina how can we learn more about what you're doing and how to support you in this journey that you're on? so um on facebook i have um several pages so i have miss columbia plus 2020 Okay. I also have She Did That LLC okay. um, on Facebook. She Did That Events LLC. And then I have my page, of course, which is Tina Darlene Torres. Uh -huh. and, and then on Twitter and on uh, Instagram, I also have She Did That Events on those two social, um, social media. And then I also have a website, She Did That Events.com. Okay. And I also have Tina D Torres. Dot com so okay. i am beginning the whole like tina torres thing so so that at least that website's created <laughs> okay nice 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 i'm excited so i'm putting um some of the links in the comments mm -hmm. but what i'm going to ask for you to do is to um when you're when we're done um if you can go into the comments and just post all your links in there so yeah. that way people can support you in all that you do with she did that with you being um, Miss Columbia with going for Miss South Carolina. Um, when I saw your page pop up, I was like, "Woo! they could have got a more perfect, a more perfect, beautiful woman to be Miss Columbia going into Miss uh, South Carolina. Thank I'm, you. I remember when Del Vaughn sent me um, your information and I went and looked at you. I was like, goodness, she's a fox. <laughs> With that red hair. <laughs> my hairdresser, Miss Yvonne Gaines. She's she's been doing my hair for five years now. Uh -huh. Yes, well, it is gorgeous. Yeah, red she, is, she's red has been my color probably for the last 10 years off and on. So mm -hmm. so yeah, it, it fits you, it's perfect. And um Thank I'm you. excited. I'm excited. So November 14th is the pageant, correct? Yes, it'll be in Georgetown, South Carolina. Okay. Um, they're going to do it virtually because, well, live because um, of COVID. So okay. the governor mandates and all that stuff. So um, it'll be, they're, they're setting it up for a live pageant. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Very nice. Have you ever been in a pageant before? No. <laughs> so this is a new journey, a new, new journey for you. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. I'm so excited for you. I don't think I would have the nerve to go and do something like that. <laughs> uh, you know, they say you got to, if it scares you, you got to do it, right? So uh, That's what they say. <laughs> they say. So, um, you, you saw me pouting earlier because I couldn't get my, um, my announcement live going. So you see, I, I probably wouldn't make it that far. <laughs> <laughs> that was me being spoiled with my husband. Yeah. All right. All right, Miss Tina. So tell us what, what can we look forward to with you and how can we support you and find you? Okay. So we are going to, we've got a couple of things that we're working on. When we drop the announcement um, on, at the gala, at that point, you're going to see a couple more things roll out. So the best thing to do is stay tuned to all of my pages because uh, we post everything there all the time. Um, but because we can't go into detail at the moment, as of Saturday, um, probably come Sunday, we'll start posting all the different things that we got coming up. Um, a lot of that will be on the She Did That page on Facebook. Okay. And of course, we are going to be, after the gala, we'll also be pushing hard with Miss Columbia Plus 2020 for the um, Miss South Carolina Plus, Plus okay. South Carolina. So we'll be working on that next. Okay. Um, and then with April being... Child Abuse Awareness Month, uh, Sexual Assault um, Awareness Month, you'll definitely be hearing some things on that as well. 
Gotcha. And then um, people can also book me to um, coordinate their events, weddings. We, I officiate weddings. You know, I just kind of do a lot of things. So yeah, just stay tuned okay. to my pages and we'll let you guys know what's coming up. Very good. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And um, I really appreciate you taking the time. I am super excited for you for becoming Miss South Carolina. I'm going to go ahead and claim it. You are going to be the winner um, because you deserve it. You deserve it. You've been through a lot. Um, you've raised three daughters. Um, you have your, your beautiful, your, your head strong, your intelligent, all that great stuff. You deserve to be Miss South Carolina. So I'm looking forward to seeing the results of that. Um, and please continue to, to use your voice to speak up and inspire others, um, which I know that you will do. And um, good luck with your gala this weekend. Um, I, would I can't wait to come next weekend, I mean, next weekend, next year to support you in 2021. <laughs> so I appreciate you um, again for taking the time. Please don't forget to put the links to all of your pages in the comments so that everybody can follow you and support you. And um, please keep us updated so that we can um, keep the Speak Up and Inspire series page updated on what you're doing as well. Okay, well, do. Thank you so much for having me. You are so welcome. You're so welcome. Good night, Miss um, Tina, and thank you again. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>